Here we are at episode three of my series. We've really learned a lot so far, but let's keep the train on the tracks and get ready to study the intricate world of public health policy. Some of the most effective and successful public health outcomes nationwide have happened due to the efforts of advocacy and policymakers. And the biggest shock to laypersons might be just how universally known and commonplace these policies are in our everyday lives. The CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, presents to us a variety of policy-focused offices and programs that exist under its umbrella of influence. These offices and programs implement public health policy at a local, state, and federal health level, depending on the nature of the policies and the jurisdiction granted to its members. A policy in the simplest terms is a set of rules and guidelines that are outlined, implemented, and, well, ideally, followed. To get a better look at what policies we can expect to see from public health workers at the national level, let's run down and summarize some of these organizations and policies displayed on the CDC's website while analyzing their uses at the population level. The PHLP, or Public Health Law Program. Some policies will be implemented as laws. Law is an important tool in the public health arsenal because we can utilize statutes to enforce certain behaviors that would advance health outcomes at a population level. To give a salient example, if a company like Monsanto sold Roundup Weed Killer as a pesticide for civil use and this product was later found to have adverse health outcomes, then policy dictates that people should have a right to know how that pesticide and the chemicals within have negatively impacted their health and be compensated for those damages. Seatbelt usage laws, the selling of alcohol and tobacco to minors, and zoning of industrial waste areas away from high density population areas are all examples of how laws can be used to leverage public health policy. For a full list of guidelines and recommendations put forth by the CDC, please check out a link in the description for the index. You will find a searchable page with hundreds of policies available for viewing. OADPS, the Office of the Associate Director for Policy and Strategy, serves a similar purpose, focusing their efforts on finding solutions to health issues and using their manpower to promote policies and collaborations between healthcare sectors. And it should be noted for transparency's sake that the CDC is indeed affiliated with the United States government and maintains a branch in Washington, D.C. for communication and collaboration with the area's nonprofits, think tanks, etc. This affiliation makes the CDC liable to at least consider the policy decisions and opinions of politicians who may not have the same seriously qualified medical background as public health workers. It's just something to consider. I want to quickly mention the Department of Health and Human Services, which is a cabinet of the government directly associated with the power of the executive branch. Ergo, they are allowed to enforce their policies at a federal level. They have many affiliates under their umbrella that make numerous public health policies and decisions every day, including, but certainly not limited to, the FDA, NIH, the National Institute of Health, and the CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. While we're on the topic of public health, a banner on their homepage displays their top tasks and priorities for public health, some of which we talked about earlier. Coronavirus, overdose prevention, smoking prevention, physical fitness and nutrition, and HIV AIDS prevention. If you'd like to visit their site for more information and to explore one of the largest departments for healthcare and health services in America, you can visit their website at hhs.gov or their index of public health policies, which I will also link in the description. Next, we'll examine Healthy People 2020, the latest effort on the part of the Healthy People Project to close the gaps between healthcare disparities and the public health of the people. Through interventions and partnerships with the HHS Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, the ODPHP, the CDC, CDC Foundation, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, 
These organizations bring together their experts to create and share policies that can revolutionize healthcare at a national level. Some current focuses of Healthy People 2020 are disability as it relates to health, healthcare associated infections, which are infections acquired when a person is under the care of a healthcare worker in a clinical environment, and oral health, among others. In addition, let me emphasize that the authors of these policies are selected according to the website, quote, based on their background and subject matter expertise, usually from outside the federal government. Up to four co-authors worked on each report with assistance from a working group of federal and non-government from varying disciplines and practice areas relevant to the report's subject matter. This means that the organization has tried to choose members of its committees that have non-governmental interests to balance out those that do in an attempt to mitigate ideological bias and remain at least somewhat impartial. I will speak in further terms about this particular phenomenon later. I'd like to pivot a bit and show you a list of people whom are responsible for public health policy that do not include the CDC or HHS. These are organizations who offer information about policy, their systems, how they will be implemented, at what levels, and what tools slash research were and are used to carry out the gathering of information for the policies. The interests of some pinpoint populations, such as Native Americans and women, are represented by specialty organizations with those populace's health in prime focus. Here is the list. The American Public Health Association, Association for State and Territorial Health Off Officials, Council for State Governments, National Association of County and City Health Officials, National Conference of State Legislators, National Congress of American Indians, National Governors Association, National Indian Health Board, Trust for America's Health, and Women in Government. As you can see, we have many interest groups being represented by a diverse number of agencies. Through these examples, we can see that policies and research are done at and thus executed at a multitude of strata. Governors of states have their own separate association, which can only affect the policies of their state of representation and their constituents. The same goes for county and city health officials who have jurisdiction over health policies only in their county and city of representation. Native Americans have two groups displayed, one for their general law, governance, and legislation, and one specifically for their health care. And still yet, women have another agency specifically for their health and other legislation, though their group may contain representatives from all levels of government, including local, state, and federal. Let me take a moment to make something clear. As observed, these multivaried agencies have the interest of select groups in mind, and their education, experience, and ideological pursuits are not equal. It is my hope that all of these groups have sound community health workers researching, implementing, executing, and surveying their policies, but many may not have those kind of impartial workers under their umbrellas. Ergo, we might run into biases that affect the healthcare policies levied by these officials, and therefore, affect the ability for their policies to do the most amount of objective good for our communities. The CDC even covers our own backs by inserting this sentence, quote, Reference of non-CDC sites does not constitute endorsements of these organizations or their viewpoints by the U.S. government or CDC. Still, I don't think that should mean we shouldn't check these policies out for ourselves or blindly follow or disavow them one way or another. We should, however, understand what policies are being levied and where they are coming from, along with the interest of that group and their members. Finally, I would like to highlight in a cursory manner how public health organizations and workers tackle policy issues from multiple angles. Usually, an issue will need a multifaceted approach to fully account for all areas of improvement or maintenance. This can range from constructive policy decisions that aim to augment something to preventative policy, which seeks to minimize or eliminate a health threat. Drug prevention is a good example containing both constructive and preventative policy procedures and guidelines. 
Since one of the main causes of stroke in elderly patients is smoking and poor cardiovascular health, a constructive position would be to educate the target demographics on healthy eating and proper daily exercise while using preventative measures like targeting smokers and seeking to help them quit. Some policies aim to target more than one problem at once. Environmental health policies such as removing lead from drinking water or reducing asthma disparities among different races intersect with health policy seeking to combat the growing public health crisis of racism. Link will be included in the description to view the, com the complete page. Feel free to download any of the PDFs and have a look at the policies. And that's it for today. I hope you learned something new. It's been a pleasure spending time with you all once more, and I hope you look forward to the next episode of this series. Until we meet again, friends, this is Fina signing out.